Gordon, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Great to have you. Yeah, no problem. Pleasure to be here. So I've just said to you in our little preamble before the, the podcast start recording that I've got a ton of questions and I actually don't know which way and direction to go because there are so many that I've got on this subject. Because I mentioned parenting in sport just comes up regularly with athletes whether it, and coaches. It's even come up with authors, just the importance of it. And even now, diving into a lot of performance psychology literature myself, like the, the athlete coach parent relationship, the triad that happens between those those three is is so interesting and vital. And I've experienced it myself. But I think to lay the foundation of this this episode would be you've given me a little bit of an insight into your family as well. But just give the listeners a bit of a background of where you've come from and how you got into creating the business now and doing the work that you're doing. Uh, and also a bit of your family history, I guess, or what's going on in the family right now. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, my background's in uh, coaching and education. So I, I was a reasonable sportsman growing up, got paid a, a little bit of money uh, in rugby for playing and was sort of an England under-19 rugby trialist, I guess, back in the day. Um, but I actually stopped playing at 22 and then got straight into coaching. Probably wasn't good enough. Uh, to be fair, to play at the level that that I wanted to play at, uh, maybe lacked a, a few bits and pieces on a personal level, but really got into coaching. And I managed to accelerate my coaching quite quickly. I remember, I think I was probably at the time the youngest level three rugby coach in the country at about 24, 25 uh, I was coaching adult rugby at 24. Uh, I was also doing elite under 18s at Sedba School at the time. I coached the forwards for five years in the early 2000s. And then I worked my way backwards in many ways, had some success in, in with the adult team, the, the under 18s. And then I ended up working with under 13s, won a couple of national titles as a coach um, at different schools in rugby sevens. And by the end of my career, was sort of having as much joy working with the under sevens and under tens throughout a week as I'd had, you know, doing the paid stuff with adults. So I did my coaching journey, I guess, in reverse um, at the same time, I was in education, so I was a qualified teacher, a, a, you know, and a, a director of sport. Um, so technically, I should be sixty um, if you look at it from a coaching point of view. And sort of <laughs> twenty odd years of doing that, I just sensed I wanted to have a bigger impact on what I was doing outside of my own bubble. But the reason that working with parents in sport came about was ten years ago. Uh, I was sat in my local village hall. Uh, taking my son to play football, kick a football around for the first time. I was doing all the wrong things as a parent because I was scrolling on my phone because, quite honestly, it was the least of my interests after working all day coaching, which was what I was doing back then. And I was approached by a Premier League football scout. And I sat there and it was like, wow, here we go. Hollywood, Hollywood is beckoning. And I, I just, I guess I went through all those emotions that any parent mm. would initially about, oh, isn't this just absolutely brilliant? How many people can I tell? This is just the greatest thing ever that somebody thinks my kid's um, a good footballer and yet he's three. And I'll never forget getting outside into the car park and turning on the car and obviously sorted him out, gave him his drink, and I'm think and thinking, what on earth are you possibly thinking? You've got this back background in coaching and education. You're getting carried away that you've, you've, you've just been told your three-year-old son's good at football and you're you're thinking all these things. So I got home and I typed into Google, like we all do, because nobody tells us how to parent. How do you support a four- or five-year-old starting out with their sort of sport and physical activity? And I just found lots of information that was scattered across sites, and I just didn't like any of it. I, I, I just felt that it was telling people what to do, that they were good and they were bad, that they were either helpful or unhelpful. A lot of it wasn't written in a way that, you know, the person in the middle of Merseyside could understand, we, you know, because everything's got to be relatable to people if we want them to, to buy into it. Um, and that's where working with parents in sport was born. So I guess the journey from there, over the next few years with my own children while still recognizing the challenges that teachers and coaches were facing um, whilst working with parents, that suddenly the business evolved and, and grew and, and got where we, where we are today. What was, the, what was the initial hope for when you're setting it up? What was sort of like the, I don't know whether it was like a mission statement or something that you, some 
critical piece that you felt was missing and that you want that that main piece of information that you wanted to start providing? I think I wanted to provide a, an independent platform of, I guess, for parents or a place where they could hear information that was given to them in a way that made them feel very comfortable that they could relate to. And even if they agreed or disagreed with some of it, it would potentially raise their own self-awareness about you know, supporting their kids. Because the reality is I live and breathe this every day and I mess it up on a regular basis. So anybody who sits there and says you can create two lists to to solve a problem of what you should and shouldn't do is is living in cloud cuckoo land for me because it, it's far more complicated than that. I think all you can do is raise people's self-awareness, support them, encourage them and and within their own context, hope that they make better choices around how they support the young people because everybody's trying to do the best for their kids. So you had mentioned about how both of your kids have play sport. So your daughter plays cricket and your son is signed at Middlesbrough. So yeah, so, plays yeah, so he, he signed at nine. He was released at 12. Um, my daughter's probably a better footballer than him, but I don't tell him that. Um, <laughs> so she's, she's a bit younger. She's only 11, but she also played for Yorkshire under 11s last year, at cricket a year young and captained a couple of times. And she, she's been selected again this year. So it's, it's really nice sort of going through the experience as a parent as well because mm. I think it allows you to then talk to parents on an equal footing and share I guess my own fails the own successes the stories that go with it and what you hear from from other people yeah so a- a- any episode that I've had before and there's probably only a couple just before this episode um, where I have given my perspective on parenting in sport but I said I don't have a horse in this race because the only part of it that I do have is my experience of being a professional athlete having been parented. And most of it is is sort of anecdotal with the the athletes that we've had on here or coaches and my experience saying that, for example, my parents were quite hands off. They they we had Roger Black on the podcast and and Roger spoke about how his parents did not come to any of his races, really. They really weren't there. And he said that he loved that. That was actually brilliant for him. It freed him up. It allowed him to not have any expectations. Sort of now reflecting past back on his career, like I think his dad had lived in some form of regret by thinking, oh, I wish I'd come to more more races. But he said, no, I thank you for doing that because it freed me up. I saw other athletes that were completely swarmed by their parents at a young age. Football's a really interesting one. I've spoken to the head of psychology at at Man City because he's my old psychologist. And to him talking about how a lot of the work that he does is is the management of the relationship with parents and the kids, especially when they're coming into those academies at such a young age. Yeah. And it's it's fascinating. But when you are doing the work that you're doing, so, so who, just before I actually ask that question, who is it that you're predominantly working in? What sort of sports are you working <laughs> in and, and oh. the areas there? Yeah, I mean, God, it, it, the, the list's sort of growing, you know, rapidly. I mean, we work with over probably 15 national governing bodies all over the world, um, from recreational sport into, you know, elite performance. I think we've worked with four premiership clubs this year and nearly 30 across the football league, uh, mm-hmm. providing support for parents, for coaches, for staff. We work in cricket pathways, we work in rugby pathways. Uh, gymnastics is big work in Singapore Australia work in the Great Britain gymnastics pathway uh, and getting more and more work there lots of exciting things coming up that I can't mention yet uh, but mm-hmm. which, will, which will be out in the next few weeks but yeah yeah huge huge range now um, and it's really exciting because you 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 get to see everything if you love sport as much as I do it's um, it, it's a joy to be involved yeah but but Again, this is me maybe putting words in your mouth, but this I'm assuming that a lot of the skills and and ability, I guess, ability that a parent has to have doesn't actually matter too much about what the sport is. That it's quite transferable across sports. What you're talking about. So leading with that, I'd like to sort of go into what are straight off the bat. What are some of the common problems that you're seeing that you're probably addressing m- most often? Well, I, th- I think the first thing to be aware, I think, as a- sports is that we've got to assume that that you know what do we've got to start with? What do parents actually know? You know, it's very easy to sit here like you and I with some background in sport and education and sports science or coaching or whatever that may be, 
and have conversations that you just assume that other people should be able to join in and understand. And yet we're dealing with thousands of parents from so many different walks of life, from from building sites to lawyers to barristers and everything in between with different upbringings, different contexts. And I think when I work with, uh, you know, a lot of Asian parents in badminton and how their hierarchy system in India and working in Singapore with gymnastics, where there are so many cultural things that you're bringing into the mix as well. I think we've got to start with the fact that, okay, they're not sports experts. They probably gather their knowledge or their perception of how they should support their kids, either through their own sporting experience, perhaps what their parents did with them, when actually probably that's probably a little bit out of date in some some situations, probably what their coaches did with them. Well, coaching's evolved massively in the last 20, 30 years, so that's going to be a little bit out of date. But then also just what they see from the adult game, things beamed in, uh, onto their phones, analysis, things. And actually, do you know what? I'll copy and paste this because obviously if it's good enough for Sky Sports, it's good enough for my nine-year-old. And actually, so, you, so what you get is you get a lot of copying and pasting in trying to do the right thing. But actually, that isn't how you develop young people or you, you develop young athletes. So unless they're given more support alongside that, you can't expect them to be drawing on drawing on it from any other form or perhaps listening to the person next to them that's always the classic you know the parent parents think we're doing a really good job here aren't we i'm really pleased with what i'm doing with my kid and then we stand next to somebody and somebody says i'm doing it a little bit differently and we suddenly throw everything out of the window and think oh god am i getting all this wrong and i'm doubting myself but we don't question who we're listening to I mean, we could be listening to any clown stood next to us with absolutely no background, but it's an amazing thing how that type of information can spread around around environments from not the right sources. Yeah, I'm even really conscious about that when I'm advising athletes and parents and things like that, because I'm like, take my advice with a pinch of salt because it is purely my own experience what worked for me isn't necessarily going to work for you yeah and uh, you didn't have my background you didn't have my upbringing you didn't have my successes and challenges and all of those obstacles or whatever it might be you've got different ones you've got different challenges and you're gonna to have to figure out how to navigate I, I listened to someone talking around it might have been on this podcast actually but that we were talking around how how people reading a lot of like self-help books and a lot of people will re- read these self-help books or coaching manuals and, and sometimes copy and paste when actually you should just learn from it. L- literally, let the idea of learning from it is going, could that work? Does that sit in my context? I don't want to copy and paste. And I have seen some athletes fall into that trap. And, and do you know what? I actually fell into that trap. I fell into even the, the comparison of other athletes and trying to do things similar, even if it's a technical thing, trying to do something similar to other athletes and not doing it my own kind of authentic way, which meant which was which would have made more sense doing it early doors. It is it's a tough one from that sense because you're trying to emulate a role model, but then you're trying to find your own spin on it. But parenting, yeah, I imagine sort of listening over the sidelines, you're you sort of go, oh well, that that person's doing well and they're they're getting in front of the coach and maybe we should be doing that. And then and then suddenly put maybe an expectation on it. Um leading on to that, expectations, what what are you, I'm sure that might be a, a sort of a, a word that gets thrown around quite a bit in what you do. I, I, without a doubt, the two the two that crop up the most, expectations and entitlement, whether we're talking with parents or whether we're talking with coaches and their perceptions of what they're seeing. Um, look, expectations are, uh, are a, 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 I guess, a tricky one to navigate. Um I do it very much based on this idea, and I work with parents that there is a big difference between expectations and dreams. Where we're allowed to subconsciously have our thoughts, mm. we're allowed to dream. There's the power of sport, the glamour of it, what we want with our kids. Our kids are allowed to dream as well, but we are also the adults, and we have got to recognize as the adults the odds of our children perhaps achieving some of these things 
that we dream about. You know, when my son signed that nine-year-old contract and I've got told I've got more chance of being hit by a meteor than him playing Premier League football for that team. Well, of course, I don't go out and say to him, by the way, mate, you've got absolutely no chance, by the way. You've, I've got more chance of being hit by a meteor. Of course I don't. But I'm the adult and I've got to make sure that my support of his experience and the things that are going on around that are, are, are in line. And I talk to parents a lot about that. And we need to be having high expectations, not necessarily of our final outcome goals, but having high expectations of what it is that's going to get our children there. So we can have high expectations of really good coaching, good relationships, good environments. But we can also have high expectations of some of the things that we can control and develop in our children. You know, your skills like determination, resilience, adaptability, creativity, good decision makers, self-organized athletes, kids who are be, they're able to be creative and, and manage situations. And I think that gives us a really good lens as parents to have far more powerful conversations and provide our kids with the building blocks that will allow them to, to give them the best chance of achieving what they want to achieve. And I think that, that some can go into it a bit blind, you know, I guess – the power of sport and what it does. And every parent thinks, yeah, but my child's going to be different. We all do that. We're allowed to do that. But the statistics don't lie. We, you know, we can think that. So I, I, I'm I'm very level on on that. And 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 again, it goes back to trying to focus on the things that you've got some control over that are going to benefit your kid, whether it's in their sport or as people, I think is a far better way of going about it. Yeah. I, I'm always talking about setting setting lower expectations but of especially when it comes to outcomes lower expectations but aimed up especially if you want to achieve them but i love what you're talking about there about them being personality and characteristic type goals that are purely process they're completely in your control or oh, everything you've spoken about there there's nothing that's not in your control and that's all you want that's all you want in it as a as a as a young athlete, you want to feel like you, everything is in your control or that you had everything in your control to give it the best crack you could because I think the worst thing I ever see is a young person not making it in a sporting environment and then reeling off a victim mentality to why they didn't make it and it being all around reasons that they actually had in their control but they chose not to control them and they focused on all the things that they couldn't control. And that for me, just it, I usually bring them awareness to it and say, hold on, the things you've just reeled off there, they were all in your control. The fact that you thought the coach had it against you, the fact that you thought the, envir the, the environment wasn't good enough for you, you, that environment and that coach didn't fo follow you around 100% of the time. So there were moments where you could have broken out and could have done th something on your own. And that requires a bit of proactivity with yourself, a bit of, determination bit of commitment bit of hard work and like those are all in your control um but they're, they're that for me I, I love what you're saying there yeah i, I just think it i think it helps parents because the reality is when you get to levels of sport where everybody's good you're going to need those skills anyway so you may as well 100%. use you, you may as well use the journey um you know we all talk about sport being this amazing vehicle to develop these skills but it's only that vehicle if we value those traits it's only that vehicle if parents are talking to the kids about it, if teachers are talking to kids about it and coaches are talking to kids about it. If we're not talking about them and all we ever talk about is an outcome, how can we expect young people to link link the character trait to the actual performance? They're just going to see, well, did I win? Did I lose? Did I score? Was I the best player? And if I failed on all those counts, oh, well, that's it for another week. That's been an absolute write-off. And, and it, there's got to be far more to it than that. And it, it can be a lot more powerful. This may seem like a, um, a bit of an obvious question or, or simple question, simplistic question. But what are some of the positives and benefits of ultimately good parenting in sport? Look, is there, is there such a thing as good parenting? I, look, I, I, th I think for me, the benefits at the moment, I think the big thing I say to a lot of parents is the fact that they're having some quality time with the kids, they're having a shared experience, that they're providing these opportunities for them and, and are involved in it, I think is huge because I've been speaking to people 
recently whose kids aren't in sport and are spending too much time on devices who they're struggling to motivate to get to do anything. I think the fact that parents are even providing this opportunity and the kids doing it has got massive benefits. I think we're going to see some huge challenges around device usage and and, and everything else that, that goes with it. I think if we get it right, I think there's probably more chance of our children as they go through the system doing it for the right reasons you know, that that, that that they are intrinsically motivated. I mean, look, there's nothing wrong with extrinsic motivation as well. You know, Dr. Kate Hayes on the on the podcast talk about some of the lionesses, and she said some of them are, are massively motivated just to be the best in the world. And that's fine as well, and that's enough to drive them on. But I think in the development of young people, particularly when they become teenagers, that, you know, if we've driven it too much, We haven't given them enough autonomy. We haven't understood their motivations. We haven't supported them in the right way. And uh, and it is fun to the kids, whatever that may be. And, you know, fun's, again, going to be different for different people. I think if we haven't provided those environments in the early stages, I think the chances when they become teenagers of continuing in the sport and driving it forward in the sport I think become a lot less. I I think there's so much choice now for young people. It's very easy just to say, I'm going to go and do something else. Yeah, you've touched on it and let's dive into it. Devices. I think this is just around parenting. This is a huge one, whether you're even in sport or not. What have you seen over the past few years? What are some of the challenges and what are some of the ways in which you are being able to advise people to combat these challenges? Look, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in device usage, but having seen a few weeks ago a brain scan coming out of Canada of young people's device usage, my gut reaction was almost to leave the call, start crying, and then start thinking that the government are going to start saying, actually, this is something that you can have when you're 18. When I looked at the damage and some of the stories that that were coming out of what the next generation may look like in terms of their emotional control, reality against virtual reality. What was this this you were seeing? I saw a brain scan of some of the changes that it can have on, on brain development and what that may lead to in what we may see from the, from the next generation of young people growing up who've heavily used um, devices. And it was quite scary. Um, it worried me as a parent. I th- look, when we talk about it in workshops on a, on a limited scale, which we do, I say to parents, we are the parents. We've mm. got to show some leadership here. We have the choice. Our kids are not our friends. If we decide they're not having them in the bedrooms in the evening, they do not need to have them in the in the bedrooms in the evening. If they want to throw a tantrum, that is absolutely fine. But we have got a choice, particularly in those formative years, to do our best to try and control that usage. You know, and you speak to lots of parents who say, oh, Gordon, really pleased you said that. You know, we've been taking them off off our kids over over dinner times. We have blocks of time in a week where we sit and watch a film and everybody's got to throw their devices away. We don't allow them in the kids' rooms. If we do it for a very limited time and we're monitoring it, you know, we, we have got to help our kids understand you know, the positive use of those devices, because they're going to be around. It's not about not using them. It's like anything, isn't it? It's like gambling anything in society. We've got to help our kids understand that in small doses, it's great. In in a massive amount of use, it it really isn't going to be. But that you could apply that to an awful lot of lot of things. But it's on us. I, I think anything around our children comes back to to what we want to do about it because we have the biggest influence on our kids they're under our control and they're in the home environment most of the time yeah that that's terrifying seeing hearing that about the the brain scan and, and even like the the emotional control and because we can sit here and say I, like I know what my devices are doing to me as a 33 year old man I know what the I know what the devices are doing to me so I'm consciously aware of that but that's coming from a what I hope to be a fully formed brain and and to be able to have those conscious rational choices but when you are developing your awareness of the world and the way you interact with the world through these devices that is so lethal and at, 
and I was talking to someone about my device use, well, my video game experience when I was growing up. Like, I think the highest PlayStation I ended up getting was like a PlayStation 2 and then, a, or maybe 3. And, and I haven't played one for like over 10 years now. It's now, but, but when I was a kid, we were growing up through the evolution of these games. So Sega Mega Drives and Nintendos and PlayStation was, yeah, like I said, I only got to three by the time sort of I was using them. And my parents were so hot on us, my brother and I, not using them and not being on them for too long. I think we would get about an hour, maybe two. If that was if that was the case, if if the weather was good, no chance. There was no chance on them them being on. Like I remember just I remember the like vivid memories of it being really sunny outside and me turning it on and then just thinking, "What are you doing, Lewis? Like they're going to come through the door at any moment now and just like get outside." And it was great. Like it wasn't it wasn't even like get outside and and go and do something. It was like just get outside. Like we had a dog, so it was like mess around with the dog, or like they were gardening and they like like go garden with them or something like that, or just yeah. whatever they were doing, or just sit in the sun and do something, or sit be outside, go down the park, um, yeah, go go out, go out with your mates. But I see now with the challenges is I've got a couple of athletes that are in that bracket of between fifteen to seventeen, and they're they'll be doing their training and they'll be working hard. And then they'll get to eight o'clock and then bang, they're on their call of duty with catching up with their mates online. The damage that that's doing in their, just from a, just from a development of a skill set, right? You, you need your recovery. You've just done all your hard work and now you're almost like throwing it down the drain by, by spending, and I mean, they're going to bed at like two in the morning. Like this mm. is, they're on it for ages. And you're just like, that's such wasted time for your development of your skill set for like ingraining all the neurological pathways of what you've just done and everything that comes with it. There's such a, a loss to that. And I, the, the danger I see in the sport like cricket, for example, there are some really go good athletes out there. So Eng England captain Ben Stokes, Joffre Archer, I think Stuart Broad as well. They, have a, they, they play video games online uh, uh, and they, they play them now. The, I think kids need to be aware of when they're watching these guys playing those and they're, they're talking about them being on Call of Duty and playing games. I'm not sure which ones they're playing. But when a, when a young person is watching them doing that, that's not what they were necessarily doing when they were your age. That's not what they were doing. They were out there developing. They were playing. They were out there. Ben Stokes had a great documentary where he talks about his childhood. There was no video games involved. Like There was, there was none of that sort of thing. So I think people need to be aware of that, that what you see now where, where these are incredibly high level athletes, they've kind of earned the right to do that. That's their, in their recovery time, they're playing those games, but they're limiting that time. They're not on it for hours on end. They're just there yeah. for a few hours, maybe max, but then they're straight in their recovery. They're getting their sleep. They're up the next day. And I think there's, there, that's the danger we see when you see athletes that are play, like on their devices or playing computer games all the time. It's, it's, it's not reality of where they were when they were your age, young age. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And look, I was fortunate because I was the generation slightly back from that where, you know, as you say, there was a, the, the first Nintendo PlayStations or it was the Sinclair Spectrum. And apart from a couple of football manager games that existed, they were in a very basic they were in a very basic form, but like you, you know, it was get out and you'd go out at eight in the morning and play till late at night and you'd go home for food and to use the toilet. And that was about, that was about it until the light went. And look, there's elements of that, that, you know, it, it's easy to wax lyrical about, about the good old days. And mm. that that's not always helpful because actually lots of society of changes, the freedom of kids to go out and play isn't probably what it once was parents probably don't feel as safe in that which is probably why that you know they end up in so much organized sport because at least mm -hmm. it's organized yet we know unstructured play is really healthy and the, there's a lot we've got to do around that I think from a, a, a developing young people point of view to be brilliant people we have got to do all we can to raise their self-awareness they perhaps start in time being able to make healthy choices around what it is that they're presented with it that you know they are going to use it it is a social time for them my mm. my children like to be on them there's no doubt in that 
Um, but you want them to understand the implications of it, what it may be doing. And I, I don't think we do that. I think in many ways it, it it's just been a it's an easy way to occupy our kids, isn't it? It's a lazy way of of getting them off our case and we're all very busy and running around and I think it's just become a, a as I say an easy an easy way out it'd be interesting to know whether there's data or research being done on kind of creating sort of markers for the amount of usage that you have as a development in development so I mean it would be a, almost a dangerous piece of research to do because yeah. you'd be looking for I wouldn't even know where to start what those markers are and finding out how much use per day creates x outcome of i don't know emotional intelligence emotional control awareness whatever it might be it's just a really tough tough conversation to be having as well because like you said you can just sit guy well my i didn't i had it like this when i was younger it's not like that now so i think people probably need that guidance don't they they just need here's a maybe an hour or so like every day whatever it might be just a real guideline just like limit them to that and then you're good and then then that could be the best way. Is that what you do with yours? Like do you do you have set yeah, those limits at yeah, all? Yeah, I think so. I mean, look, when they've done everything else and they've d- they've done all the work and they've done all the sport and you feel like they've chucked enough at that as a bit of downtime, maybe give them a bit longer because it, it doesn't bother me quite as much. And I think there's mm. probably do that. But, you know, the, the, the normal week is pretty busy anyway, to be fair. It tends to come in either holiday time or at weekends when, when all the sport and all the other activities is done. But it's definitely very popular. You know, I'm not going to. I'm certainly not saying my two are perfect because it would still be one of the first things they would gravitate to. Certainly with my son, you know, or what do I do now? Look around. Oh well, I'll go and I'll go and do something with a device. But I think you know that again that everybody's going to be different because I think if you had a friend that lived next door, you had somebody that you played with that that you could do those things and you could go and call on and and you could go out and play. I think you do it. I think it's when kids are left now to their own devices to make up games, be creative, think, particularly if there aren't a lot of other people around to to join in that. I think Mm. it probably is the most appealing of what what is left. Yeah. So I want to ask around, and this is probably going to be a bit more of a, uh, I don't know if it's controversial or challenging, but it's what are some of the common big pitfalls or mistakes that you're seeing parents making during their development and the ones that you would say, okay, those are having real detrimental effects on on the athlete? Uh, God, I'm trying to think. Question. I mean, look, I think parents who maybe just do the overbearing bit of much, maybe micromanage their kids a little bit too much watch for every single you know almost expect perfection and nothing's ever mm. quite good enough where where perfection um doesn't exist i think parents who don't recognize the fact that we know the best nine-year-old doesn't make the best 12-year-old the best 12-year-old doesn't make the best 15-year-old that the best 18-year-old doesn't necessarily make the best under 21 and the fact that we've got world junior athletes who then can't even break into the senior ranks that I think that if we're getting carried away and and celebrating the wrong things, that it's all about a specific outcome, I think that's not healthy. I think it gives the wrong messages to to the young people who are who are, are starting to do well. Um, I think car journeys home and the aftermath of of mm-hmm. managing disappointment. I don't think parents get that wrong because they try to get it wrong. I think it's such a difficult thing to do as a parent in terms of managing when your child's disappointed and they're, and yeah. they're sat next to you. I see a bit of that. And I think just, um, I just think our control of our emotions around this sport, that if we're really revved up and expecting to see something, it doesn't happen and we're not able to control I guess our emotions and then the the how we react and behave around that. I think again a, a, another problem if we can't manage it. But you know, look, watching your kids play sports a really emotive experience. It's really hard work, and when you talk to parents, a lot of people find it find it really challenging. I mean, I go and sit in the car when my daughter bats in cricket, and I'm halfway under the steering wheel. Now she doesn't know that. 
But I just think that's better for everybody that that's where I am. But that's a choice I've been able to make. All the other stuff doesn't bother me at all. I'm out watching, you know, all of it, not an issue. There's just something about that, whether or not because it's my daughter, whether or not because it's a a one-on-one thing and I'm thinking the next ball, that's the end of it. I don't know. But again, I I think there's so many things that can go on in in, in a given week that trying to just make better choices rather than deliberate because nobody deliberately tries to to get it wrong as i said at the beginning i mean we've said there about it being like overbearing and parents being overbearing because i think that's where people go to with perhaps parenting in sport they think of the overbearing parent the one that's kind of controlling perfectionistic maybe what about the ones that overpraise kind of overconfident with the child and and maybe allow their child to live in a less real world to where they're actually at i mean it, i mean it's just as dangerous isn't it i'm writing a blog at the moment on toxic positivity uh and I'm, having trouble, I'm having trouble trying to trying to frame it and, and what it looks like so i'm working quite hard on that yeah look i think that's equally damaging i i think that you know i i had a parent a, a few weeks ago say to me gordon what do i say to my child if they've had a bad game and it was a live workshop. And I said, what, you mean be honest with your kid? And I said, would your parents have told you that you hadn't had a great game? She said, yeah. I said, well, why are we ripping up everything that has ever gone before? Mm-hmm. Just like anything that's new, why have we decided that any form of parenting or anything that's ever gone as a new generation of parents, just let's rip that up and let's do it our way? Because actually, we do need to have honest conversations with our kids. We do need to be realistic with them. We do need to let them talk in 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 their own. We do need to be able to manage those conversations. And I uh, and I think that you know it can be equally as damaging. Letting them get carried away, telling them it's brilliant when it's not brilliant. You know that that's not that's not a good thing either. You know, so being put involved in sport is full of ups and downs it always has been always will be we're not dealing with a new phenomenon here this is what it's going to look like we've got to embrace the reality of that more and we've got to help our kids through the development of those skills help them to thrive and if they don't make it in sport they're going to be really good people who are going to thrive in whatever they end up doing yeah i think this is where my dad i kind of will praise him quite a bit for this is because Whenever I had a bad game and there were many, he or there was a setback and things just didn't go my way, he wouldn't, he would never really sugarcoat it. He would just say, Well, what do you want to do? But so he put it on me. What do you want to do? How do you want to get there? And then it was essentially like that car ride home, whether he was consciously doing this or not, or this is just how he was wired, he would he would say to me, What do you, how do you want to how do you want to make this situation better? Or like what what's the thing you want to work on? next right and then in so now looking back of it back at it i was i was kind of going home yes getting over disappointment oh, i've played a bad game and yes there was those those emotions but then almost by the time i was home i was kind of excited by the idea of getting to the next training session to put it right and so yeah. it turned that disappointment into excitement because there was an opportunity to grow and learn from it now i have no idea i've never really spoken to my dad about his parenting style and like how he did it because I think one of the best things I've ever been told is parent is a parent for the first time all the time, right? It's whether you've got one kid or 10 kids, like every kid is different. And I have no idea whether he was consciously doing that. But for me, it works so well because I was just fueled with motivation for the next time. And yes, it didn't take away the emotion of it. Maybe there's an argument that I actually hid the emotion too much, but it did give me motivation to go to go to the next day training session and try to make it right and just give it give it a crack. Yeah, a lot. I think inadvertently, I mean, he's done some brilliant brilliant stuff, whether he, he was aware of it or not. And I think the key to I think the key to all of that is that asking our children questions that allow them to reflect on their own sporting experience is critical because kids are amazing. They do start talking. They almost in many ways start to talk about finding their own potential solutions. And we've got to ask them questions that allow them to do that Mm -hmm. rather than be in a rush to right all of the wrongs very quickly, 
tell them what we think they should be doing and do our way. And I like the stuff that, you know, sort of like Dan Abrahams does here uh, around, yeah. you know, I, I think things like working with your kids around, you know, what would you have given yourself as a score today out of 10? And our kids sort of say, oh, well, I would have given myself an eight. And you can say, okay, then, you know, what would have made it a nine? What would have made it a five? And children start to understand what that that sort of gauge looks like. I, I like that form of conversation because I think it takes out an element of emotion. But I also think that if we know later on that one of the key psychological characteristics for developing excellence is the ability of our children to effectively evaluate performance or athletes to evaluate performance, it's a really healthy step for us to take as a, a parent on a, a much lesser scale to be having those conversations. The funny bit is, of course, when you start doing that with your kids and you say, what would you have given yourself today? And the kid goes, oh, I would have given myself eight out of 10. And you're looking around thinking, you are joking. I would have <laughs> given that a four. You know, and the ability not to, you know, because yeah. children see the world very differently to adults. But ultimately we're we're trying to prepare them for the next stages of life and and there's so much cool stuff we can do and and help them out with it as they're going that's an interesting point as well isn't it the kind of overconfident child that's not living in reality of what they've done there's a discrepancy between what's actually gone on and what they think's gone on and that's tough that that's a, a challenging one and and maybe is society playing a bigger role there in how kids are wanting to show perfection. I've got this real interest in, and I'm going to be doing a research project on perfectionism because I've got a, such an interest in it because I think it's just on the up and it's just really, really coming to the forefront. And just yeah. seeing this self-perfectionistic striving of each individual and then the external perfectionistic expectations for them. And it's creating this narrative that I'm not, I'm not good enough unless I'm constantly at my best. I'm not good enough unless I'm constantly doing everything that I, or achieving all of my goals that I'd hoped to achieve yesterday. And yeah. I think that is all, you're almost seeing little egos, like little egos, in, and it's okay to, to allow yourself to be rubbish, to fail. And if you don't create that early on, then you never feel failure. And then when you get it later on, you just set yourself up for a harder fall. Look, and, that, and that's where the whole thing's bonkers because children aren't machines, so their best is going to look different every day. They are going to have lots of moments of failure and disappointment. There certainly isn't a thing that exists called perfection because it, it really doesn't. And if it does, your kids aren't being challenged hard enough. So that should never exist. And we've got to be more realistic to what that looks like. And as I say, not always be you know, demanding of perfection because – that's where we end up with children who, because the goals placed on them or the expectations on them, suddenly go from being perhaps what could have been healthy, high expectations in some respect to basically just being a boatload of pressure because mm. those those expectations are um, not realistic, they're inflexible, they're not well enough supported, and then kids are just carrying around the weight of the, the weight of the world on their performances. And again, you know, just got to make people aware that there is a choice, that it doesn't have to look like this. I mean, I, look, I, this is the best story I got told around this because there's a woman I work with called Sarah Murray. She's brilliant. We've just written a book together and she ran the performance parenting program at Brighton and Hove Albion for 15 years. And she works as a sports psych across a number of top level sports at the moment. And we get on very well. And she said to me, she said, Gordon, how often do you go and watch your, your son's game? And I said, oh, well, most weekends, so, you know, if I'm not working, I'll do my best to get there. And then she said, no, how often do you watch the game? And I'm like, well, Sarah, this is such a stupid question. I've known you for, for months. And then I'm thinking, oh, no, I'm walking straight into this. And you're exactly what I, I didn't know what was coming, but I'm thinking, no, she's far too bright to be on me with this. And and so I watched, OK, I said, you, you know, the answer to that she said, OK, I'm going to tell you. She said, what do you do when you go and watch uh, Liverpool? So, well, I have a few drinks and you'll never walk alone, and have a, a good day out. And she says, yeah, go on. She said, do you watch the ball or do you watch Virgil van Dijk for 90 minutes? And I said, well, I watched the ball. She said, what do you do when you watch your son? 
She said, I bet you're there. You'll be watching every behavior, every mannerism, every mistake, yeah. everything else. You'll be the coaching hat will be on. And do you know what? I said, oh, okay, I'm going to, I'll, I'm, yeah, you've got me. I'm holding my hand up. Yeah, you're probably right for a large part of, <laughs> of what's going on. So we thought, okay, well, that's good because it's a good story, this, and it's a good awareness piece. But we then went to have a look at bits of stats from the Premier League. And we saw that, you know, Mo Salah perhaps dribbles the ball eight times in a game, but he may lose it four. Harry Kane scores one in five shots. Could you imagine as a parent if we're on a 20% or a 50% success rate? We'd be going absolutely bonkers and hitting the roof. And yep. it's because we get so obsessed and micromanage and expect this perfection that doesn't even exist with the very best in the world, yet we're putting it onto our kids. I mean, it was a great story. I don't know how we ended up where we ended up. but No, but I, that is there's a story I have that's so similar. And John Lewis, who's been on the podcast, he was one of my teammates, legend of uh, cricket in Gloucester, Surrey, and played for Sussex, my team, where he ended his career. But he's now the um, – he was the England bowling coach. He's now the women's head coach, the England women's head coach. And – he, we had a training camp one year and he sat us down and I think he was still playing and he he had said, it was, it was a bowling camp, so all the bowlers were there and he goes, lads, how many wickets do you think I've taken in my career? And he's taken like 700 wickets in his whole career. He goes, how many fifers do you think I've taken? And we're like, oh God, John, you're an absolute legend, like 80, 90, whatever it might be. And he goes, 35. So... Out of all of my days, and he said, I've played these amount of games. I think he, he played a ridiculous amount of games. And he said, I have, you would classify for us my day where I've had a great day. And that happens 7% of the time. So he said, 93% of the time was not my day. And all you've got to do is figure out how you make your next day that 7%. Or you try to, when you do get your 7% day, you make it your day. So I looked at that and I looked at the stats for like the greatest batsman to have ever lived. And you've got people like Brian Lara, Sachin Tendulkar, Jack Callis, Alistair Cook. And like these guys, they averaged a, a hundred every four test matches, but that's eight innings. So it's 100 every eight innings. Now, if you're a young person playing, let's say 12 games a year and your son gets 100 or your daughter gets 100 in a year they're, they're doing all right because if they got two they're up there with the stats of essentially the best that have ever played in the game and that for me is 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 again it's like about setting that expectation bringing reality to to where they're currently at like and and i think i, I think i'm very conscious of time here gordon and um this is this is fascinating it's almost like the time has flown by because it's such an interesting interesting topic one one sort of question would be how do you navigate parents to let them know whether what they're doing is whether it's helping or hindering i guess it goes back to what we said at the beginning that what might be helpful for one kid may be a hindrance for another and i i don't think that again that there's necessarily going to be a list of things that are that are that are helpful are going to hinder i mean mm. i think it's more I think it's far more complex than that. I I do think that that self determination stuff around some degree of autonomy, yeah, allowing them to reflect, you know, their motivation and and why they're playing and understanding that is certainly going to be on the helpful side. I think on the negative side, the hindrance is going to be if we have unrealistic expectations, if we don't support in a healthy way that we're always negative with our kids that we're doing it because our behaviors are based on what we want rather than what they want uh, i think that mm -hmm. that's gonna obviously have a have a hindrance but you know what I, and this is where i say it becomes really complicated i've spoken to some parents you know it's all very well us sitting here saying this is how it should be 
you know, when you, you're in the middle of Sri Lanka and you live in poverty or you're in South London and you're trying yeah. to be a professional footballer and, and your family's expectations are on you to get you out of poverty and maybe give them a different type of life, you, you, you know, it's all very well, you know, waxing lyrical about what it should actually look like. We're, we're dealing with a very different, you know, type of relationship and a very yeah. different type of conversation. Uh, I think we've got to be aware of that. And as I say, look, even working with in countries like Singapore, a lot of the Indian community in badminton, I think the one thing that people can still attach themselves to and have a positive is in the growth of a wonderful human being and the values of some of the things that they want their kids to be. And I think if we can link those building blocks to their sport to give them the best chance of how they're winning and why they're winning and help parents support the development of that, I just think we're in a far healthier place than than going at it in any other way. Yeah, that that's pretty much the the ethos of my work when working with athletes is developing the human being first and then the athlete second because we know the stats of whether you make it in at the top level or not. It, it's such a it's such a small chance, but what sport does provide is a great platform to create great people, and not only that create great ambassadors even if it's just in the local community whether you don't play the premier league but you end up playing in a division side in your local area you can still be a representative of your community and then it's around about the characteristics that you want and even if you then go into a job or in a, another career you become a parent yourself you're instilling positive characteristics and that and that that for me is is where i think if you can build that autonomy in the kids as well to want to do that to want to create a good human being that's a beautiful place to be everything around that that self-determination of of who they want to be i think if, regardless of outcome regardless of what you get on the yeah. field you're just going to win you're just going to yeah, win that's it you're you're in a win win and look it's worked really well in our work and parents saying that it just gives you a far greater meaning than did you win? Did you score? Were you the best? And and that's very much where we're up to at the moment. It, it may change, but that, that's where we are today. Just before we wrap up, Gordon, is there any sort of final thoughts or points that you want to to get across or you anything you want to signpost for people? We'll get on to where people can find you, but any sort of last thoughts that you might have? No, not, I mean, not over. I mean, it's been a, a, a fantastic hour, but I lo absolutely loved the conversation. I mean, it could go on for... Hey, honestly, um, it could go on for ages. <laughs> for, for ages, for a lot longer. Um, I, I, just, I, I, I just encourage parents to just think about spending some time just trying to inform themselves about how they can best support the kids. It's a really valuable thing, and it, it, it's very worth doing. And it's not about, you know... One thing we always say at our workshop, it's not about telling people how to parent. It's not about telling, you know, preaching to people. It's not about anything like that. It's about trying to support and engage because we all want to do what's best for our kids. And I think that I've learned through my own failings, of which there have been many and there continue to be on a regular basis, that if we can just keep trying to be better and get better, we can't do any more then. And we can sit there at the end when they've gone and say, actually, do you know what? I gave this a, a damn good go and I tried to do my best, even though I got it wrong on an awful lot of occasions. And mm. I think a lot of parents have had so many recently after workshops who have just come and shook my hand and said, thank you for trying to make sense of, of what it could potentially look like. Yeah. I, I had one guy in a football club the other week who sat there and he said, Gordon, he said, I'm everything you're telling me that I shouldn't be. He stood up in front of her, he's brilliant. I'll never forget this ever, I don't think. And he said, I, I'm desperate to be better. He said, I know that I fall into it. I said, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm damaging. Got up at the end of the session and he was almost like Braveheart. He challenged the whole group of parents to be better. And he just said, we've all got to be better. We know what he's talking about makes sense. We've mm. all got to do it and try and support. And I just thought, wow, for someone to be so open and honest and open to the fact that and, and be, you know, recognize that actually there were bits he could do better. I just thought, wow. And it 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 makes it all worthwhile when you have when you have moments like that. Yeah. I think even from my side, like the the one little bit that I might add, having been an athlete myself, is 
if you're unsure of what what support looks like genuinely open up a conversation with your kid and say how how would you like me to support you do you want me at the games do you want me to what do you want the car ride home to look like what's going to make you feel better like I said that bit around my dad and having the sort of the excitement of how I could get better just motivated me continuously that may not work for other people but I think just having the conversation of like what does support look like for you depends on the age of the kid as well to know whether what that looks like totally um yeah I'm probably thinking in teens here yeah. And I think that and look, their responses will change. <laughs> um, you've yeah, reminded, totally. <laughs> you've just reminded me something just on that last point. So I think, again, this is – we do a lot of work with parents, but then there's sometimes we put parents and children together. But we would never put parents and children together until we've done some work with the parents because you've got to be prepared for what some of the responses may look like, what it may look like, particularly if you haven't done what you're saying there, that you haven't mm. had lots of those dialogues with your kids. And I was sat in a room and I said to this boy, front row, I think he was 15, I said, what do you want from mum in the car on the way to your competition? And in front of 50 parents and 50 kids, he said, quite honestly, I wish she wasn't there. And I'm stood in the front of this room with this mum looking crestfallen next to him, a packed audience in this room. I'm thinking, how do I get out of this one? And I'm like, oh, yeah, but it can't all be bad. There must be some good stuff for a mum. And thankfully, this boy said, oh, yeah, best mum in the world for the rest of the week. I love her to bits. I thought, thank goodness for that. <laughs> and he went on to basically say, yeah, she couldn't do any more. So I said, well, what, what, what goes wrong in the car journey to the competition and he said oh well the moment she turns on the ignition he says she just doesn't shut up and because her character was so different at that point compared to how she was on the rest of the week he picked up that she was really worked up and it was starting to have a negative impact on him mm. and I think that the opening up of those dialogues where they're now you know listening to music together not having those conversations mum's aware that they're not going to talk about it and then I think they've agreed that they won't talk about it for half an hour afterwards either. So he's got time to process it. But then he said, mum, I'm very happy to answer any questions you have. They've got something that works for them through going back to how we started today. Every relationship is going to be different. Every family is going to be different. Work together using what we know and, and try and make the best of it for you. Yeah, love that. Kids take on so much more than you think as well. It's an even... I think even now, like they're so aware and they're such sponges of their environment and that's just becoming more and more obvious. So yeah, open up those conversations. Look, Gordon, thank you so much for your time. Where is the best place to send people to learn more about what you do and get in touch if they want to get in touch? Yes, just visit the website, um, www.parentsinsport.co.uk. Uh, we're also on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at WWPIS. And if people want to contact me, there's a phone number and uh, email on the website platform. No worries. I'll leave all the links in the show notes for that. Look, like I said, this could have gone on for, for ages. I've got a stack of notes here and, and it's such a fascinating topic. It comes up so often and there's no right or wrong. Like we said, there's nothing that's, there's no silver bullet here, but it's I think purely around awareness, constantly trying to we've got to be better like that guy said like just try to be better just continuously look how can i develop don't think you know how to parent i feel, I feel parenting also can be a very judgmental space as well can't it? it can be very easy to look at how someone else is doing it you don't really know their backstory and yeah there's so many directions we could have gone but i'm so thankful for this conversation so i appreciate your time for no thank you absolute joy to join you